are delighted to see you here. Healthy Young Minds, Media, Mental Health, and connection. It is no surprise that our community has turned out because I know how important mental health and well-being is certainly to the USC community and most definitely here at Annenberg. So thank you very much for being here. Um, I would like to introduce our distinguished guests, and I'm about to get out of the way and turn it, also turn it over to our fabulous moderators. Um, I think many of you know Jim Steyer, the founder and CEO of Common Sense Media. Um, you know that he is one of the nation's foremost experts on children, families, and media and a longtime advocate for the health, for healthier relationship between families and media and families and technology. He's also a longtime um, Annenberg and Willow Bay uh, partner and collaborator and a very, as you know, very familiar face, um, actually familiar presence right here in this, in this very spot. So Jim, as always, thank you. Thank you for letting us participate in your town hall series and Delighted, delighted to have you here. Um, and of course, our, our honored guest today, um, Dr. Vivek Murthy, our nation's Surgeon General. This is his second tour of duty um, as Surgeon General, and I can tell you that this country is better off because of it. So thank you very much for doing a second tour of duty. So the Surgeon General's mission is to help lay the foundation for a healthier country using science, um, respecting and respecting that science to provide clear, consistent, and equitable guidelines and resources to the public. Um, Dr. Murthy, as you may know, has made mental health and well-being a cornerstone um, of his work as Surgeon General. And just this week, he proposed um, a national framework framework to rebuild social connection and community in America as a way to combat an epidemic of loneliness, which is, is proving challenging to our physical and mental well-being. So thank you very much for doing that. We're looking forward to speaking with you more about that. I should also say that Dr. Murthy is kind of a regular here as well, although this is the first time that we've had the opportunity to welcome him to USC and to Annenberg in person. So again, thank you, thank you for being here. Um, now I'm going to uh, introduce our superstar moderators, um, Meredith McCabe and Shreya Ranganathan, who I'm just saying they're graduating seniors. So I was saying, no, don't go. Please stay a little bit longer if you can. I know your parents don't feel that way. They're ready to have you graduate and be off the tuition paying payroll, but i um, very excited to have them here. So I'll tell you a little bit about them. So Meredith is studying journalism with a minor in psychology and law. Um, she's currently the executive producer for Annenberg Radio News. Um, as a journalist, Meredith had the chance to cover a number of topics, um, political issues like redistricting, early voting during the midterms, and trends in religion and cultural movements. She also, um, because of that law minor, um, served as an intern for the LA um, County Public Defender's Office. And she, one of the things that she's really passionate about is breaking down harmful and exclusive dialogues in the health and wellness community um, particularly as um, they pertain to mental health and Gen Z. So, Meredith, thank you for being here. And Shreya, so Shreya is studying journalism and screenwriting. Um, she's really merged her interests with mental health advocacy and unscripted multimedia storytelling to produce some rather extraordinary content, um, such as um, a nationwide PSA with um, our Heisman Award-winning Caleb Williams that you may have seen uh, at the game and on ESPN, and most recently, she produced a documentary called Meeting Ms. Loomis, which traces a retired teacher's journey navigating grief and loneliness. So again, very appropriate to today's conversation. Shreya really wants to help more underrepresented communities find healing in media and to use the power of digital content to drive meaningful awareness to mental health for the next generation. She's also a certified yoga instructor, so we'll be doing some downward dogs um, after this. Um, but, but she feels passionately, again, about introducing students to the mental and physical 
physical benefits of yoga um, and, and how it allows them to support their own well-being. So I know Meredith and Shreya want to dig in, particularly um, hear more from Dr. Murthy about these new initiatives and more, and learn more about both of our guests' um, advocacy for children and mental health. But I am now going to put down the mic and let um, Jim Steyer say a few words. I just want to let you know that we are saving time for questions um, at the end. So please get your questions ready. And anybody who's standing, come on, come on in and grab some seats. Come on, it's just us. Come on in, climb in. Everybody come in. Come on, there you go. Okay. Jim, I'll turn it. Come on down. Okay, thank you so much, Willow. I will just say to all you USC folks, even though another great dean of the Annenberg School, Jeff Cowan, Dr. Dr. Jeff Cowan is sitting here in the front row. How lucky you are to have Willow Bay as your dean here at the Annenberg School. And that is so true. And I will just say how lucky we are at Common Sense Media to have uh, Dean Bay and the Annenberg School as our partner now for almost a decade on a variety of different initiatives, this mental health uh, campaign being one of them. And just for one minute, because you're going to be in for a huge treat because Dr. Vivek Murthy is one of the best speakers ever and actually the inspiration in many ways for this Healthy Young Minds campaign that we are partnering with the Annenberg School here today on and that we're going to do around the United States and quite frankly globally over the next couple of years. Because quite simply, whether we like it or not, this country is in the middle of a youth mental health crisis. And that, I would argue, predates the pandemic. In fact, we were talking to Dr. Murthy before the COVID-19 pandemic about doing public awareness efforts around the youth mental health challenges in this country. And obviously, the pandemic exacerbated a lot of the issues that are already there. But I'm looking at some of the young people there. One of the things Dean Bay forgot to mention is I'm a Stanford professor. And so we haven't had a, ever had a Heisman Trophy winner since Jim Plunkett, by the way. But... Um, I would just tell you in my big class that I teach this fall, and they say this to SC students, we have over a thousand kids in the class, and I say to them every week, how many of you all, I would ask them almost every week, how many of you think we're in a youth mental health crisis here on the Stanford campus? And they would all nod their heads like some of you are. And then I would say, how long take you to get an appointment at Vaden, the health center, if you actually have to talk to somebody about that? So bottom line is, this is an incredible challenge for this country, for young people, for families, for educators. And that said, we absolutely have to tackle it and, and give students, parents, educators, and every single person in this society the ability to face some of those challenges in clear and simple ways and overcome what is truly a crisis. And that's really all, that's the introduction I was gonna say, because we're so looking forward to hearing from you all, the audience, but also from our two student moderators. And I am, thanks again, Dean Bay, you always have students as part of these, uh, of these uh, panels and town halls, so couldn't be happier to be here. And again, I will just tell you, the number one expert in the world, not just the United States, on this issue, is the man to your left or looking at me and on my right, Dr. Vivek Murthy, who has been sounding in a really thoughtful way and constructive way the alarm about this mental health crisis for years, who if you saw this week and we will make copies of Ill Everybody, wrote a beautiful op-ed um, about loneliness in the, in the Sunday New York Times and who was really an incredible pioneer and leader on this, so I am honored to be on the stage next to you, Vivek. And I will turn it over to the people who are running the show, which they should be, students. All right, Shreya, up to you. Thank you so much. This is, I'm so glad that we're all here today and we get to talk to literally some of the best people working on this issue, these issues that are so important. And um, you touched on it a little bit, but this op-ed, Fabulous. Me, both me and Meredith felt seen in it, and we felt heard. And, and just the way that you so eloquently were able to discuss stuff that's very hard and vulnerable. And um, we just really thank you for doing that in your position. It means so much, Dr. Murthy. And I'm just, I bet many people in the audience agree. 
And I think with that, we'll go ahead and get started with some really, we had so many questions about um, ourselves and our roles within, within this um, crisis that we're in, but also just what all of us can do to work together to, to make a difference. And to begin, Dr. Murthy, I'd love to touch on this op-ed. Specifically because you talked about what inspired you to want to use your platform to talk about loneliness. And in that op-ed, you showed a lot of strength and a lot of vulnerability, but you talked about a feeling of shame that you felt um, at one point when you felt loneliness, and also how it was hard for you to reach out to friends and your support system. That really resonated with the both of us, and I think a lot of people in the crowd have felt or feel the same at some point during their loneliness journey. I'm curious what you think would be good advice to students and to the people in the audience about navigating reaching out to a friend in a time of need. Mm. Well, that's a great question, Shreya, and I'm also just so thrilled to be here with all of you. And uh, Jim, I, I have to hire Jim as my PR agent <laughs> because he's such a... I'd be willing to do that, actually. He, he's so generous and, and, and kind with his support, but he's been a great friend and partner. Uh, and just thrilled to be here uh, with you know, Dean Bay and with all of you at USC. Uh, this issue of, of loneliness that we're starting with, if you had asked me in medical school, or shortly after medical school, is this a health issue? I would have said no. I didn't learn about it in any medical school classes. I certainly haven't heard anyone talking about it at research conferences. I haven't read any research papers on this topic. I don't think this is a health issue. But an interesting thing happened to me, which is when I started seeing patients, even as a third year medical student, I realized that people would come in for a pneumonia or a blood clot or another infection. But when I started talking to them, I would realize that many of them were actually struggling with loneliness. It wasn't the first, you know, the first concern that they shared, but it was certainly there present in their lives. And when I became Surgeon General in 2014, I had this great privilege of traveling around the country and sitting in rooms like this and talking to people in their living rooms. And I started to hear more and more stories uh, about loneliness. And it became clear to me that this is extraordinarily common. And so we, yesterday we issued, uh, the, for the first time, a Surgeon General's advisory on loneliness and isolation. In fact, that's what we have right up here. And what we laid out here is the fact that one in two adults in America are saying that they are experiencing measurable levels of loneliness. And we know that young people are actually struggling the most with loneliness. The good news is, to, share, to your question, there is a lot that we can do uh, as friends, as family members, as peers. And he, here are a few things to keep in mind like if you are struggling with loneliness. Number one, it's important to know that you're not alone in your struggles. There are many people who experience this, and it can seem like there aren't because people don't talk about this. Uh, Shreya, the shame that you mentioned is real, right? People feel like if I say I'm lonely, that means I'm not likable or I'm not lovable or people don't want to be with me or around me. And nobody really wants to feel that way. Yet so many of us are experiencing loneliness. So that's the first thing is know that you are not alone. The second thing is to recognize when you open up a conversation with somebody, when you share with a friend, there's a very good chance that they are in fact struggling and your sharing may give them permission to open up and share as well. It can be really good for both of you. But the third thing just to remember is that we have to check on each other more. We I think sometimes look at other people's lives from the outside. We look at their social media feeds, we look at how they are at parties and we think, wow, they seem really happy. Everything seems to be going for them. Everything seems to be great in their life. But we don't know what's happening inside unless we actually ask people as we not only ask them how they are, but then pause and actually wait to listen to the answer. And that's what we have to do more, especially at a time where our lives are moving faster and faster and faster. And when there are so many things that are pulling us away from in-person interaction with one another, you know, so much of our lives have moved online. And it's not that online platforms and social media are all bad. No, not at all. I mean, there are some benefits certainly that can come from them. But whenever we go through major changes, we've got to ask, what are the pluses, what are the minuses? And I think our relationships have taken a real hit, not just in the last couple of years during the pandemic, but really over the last 40 to 50 years, as people's participation in local community organizations has declined, as more engagement has been transformed you know, by technology, not always in good ways. And as also as we've moved more and changed jobs more, right? we tend to not be as rooted as we were before. So again, it's not that we need to all stay in the same place and never move again, but now we have to be intentional 
about making time for people in our lives, spending time in person with one another, creating safe spaces and sacred spaces in our life that are actually free of technology so we can focus on one another. And that's what we're called to do. That's what we laid out in the advisory. And that's why I really think of this as one of the great generational challenges of our time. Because if we are not connected with one another, that affects everything. It impacts our mental health, increases our risk of depression, anxiety, and suicide. It increases our risk of heart disease, of dementia, of stroke, and of premature death. In fact, the increase in risk of premature death that we see with social disconnection is similar to what we see with daily smoking. It's even greater than what we see with obesity. But we also can't function as a society. We know that people's performance in school and the workplace is worse. Civic engagement is lower when people are disconnected. In every way you look at it, our connections with one another are the fuel that allow us to show up in our life and to be our best selves. And that's why we have to rebuild that connection now. Absolutely, yeah, I think, and, and on that point with the six pillars, I think Meredith, you had something with, with that exact framework and the idea of digital media too, right? Yeah, so jumping into the advisory that just came out on Tuesday, of the six pillars you described, you described one which is reforming our digital environments, which is kind of what you were just touching on now. So, of course, there's a bunch of stuff that tech companies can do. Um, and Jim, I know you've you've done a lot of work in that area, which we'll which we'll definitely hit on later in this conversation. But Dr. Murthy, could you talk about what steps as individuals we can take as kind of building barriers against this loneliness when we're using social media and other media platforms? Absolutely, and I'm glad that we'll talk about what you know platforms can do and what policymakers can do, and Jim certainly is an expert uh, on that as well. But since you asked about individuals, uh, you know, I, number one, I would just say, if, if let, me, just let me ask you, just by a show of hands, how many people have actually struggled with, with maintaining a healthy relationship with their phone or with social media? All right, so just about it. high. Right? Who hasn't? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's a better question. Yeah. This is a universal struggle. And the reason I wanted that show of hands is sometimes it can feel like when we're struggling to get off of our phones and go to bed, uh, or when we're struggling to actually get off of looking at our social media feeds, because we realize it's making us feel worse, but we can't actually get off of it. Sometimes we can get down on ourselves and think, gosh, I just don't have enough willpower. What's wrong with me? The truth is actually there's nothing wrong with you. The platforms are actually designed in ways to maximize the amount of time you spend on them, right? So uh, they're using the, you know, the, the deepest understandings of human psychology to design features and experiences that pull you in. So it's not a surprise that we're having a difficult time here. But here are a few things I think individuals can do. Uh, so number one is to designate some times in your day when you do not have your phone on you, or you're not engaged with your phone. Now, here are some examples of when that could be. You're having lunch or dinner with a friend. That's a time when we can actually put our devices away. And it turns out when we do that, it increases the quality of our conversation. Even when you just have a phone lying face down on the table, and you think, I'm not really looking at it, the studies actually show it decreases the quality and satisfaction that people get from that conversation. The second thing that you can do, the area, though, in addition to meals, Let's think about bedtime, right? So a lot of us go to sleep with our phones. It's the last thing we see at night. It's the first thing we see in the morning, right? But we also can stay up later than we want to because we're often on our phones. In fact, a, a large proportion of young people say on surveys that they are staying up past midnight on weekdays, which is not something that you want a, four, a set, you know, eighth, ninth, 10th grader doing necessarily because it robs them of sleep, sleep impacts mental health, but it's happening. So it could be time around meals, it could be time when you're interacting in person with others, it could be time right before bed, but having those sacred spaces is important. The second thing though you can do is you can make these packs to change behavior with other friends. You know, we, if you've ever tried, like, let me ask you this too. Who's ever tried to start a diet or a gym routine and fallen off the wagon? I'm gonna raise my hand, because I have, right? But one thing that's interesting is whenever we make a pact with somebody else, with a friend, to say, okay, we're both gonna do this and we're gonna hold ourselves accountable, that actually is much more successful at changing our behavior. So when you make these shifts, find a friend and make a pact with them, because that's much more effective, right? And then the third thing I would just suggest, and there are many more things we could talk about here, is to pay attention to how you feel when you're using social media. There's some uses of social media that might make you feel good. For example, you might connect with an old friend that you haven't seen in a long time, and that might lead you to have a phone conversation with them. That, that's great. 
But if you find yourself scrolling mindlessly and you realize that you're getting fatigued, you're feeling worse about yourself, you're just watching all these incredible things people are doing, but you're feeling worse and worse and worse, that's important to know, to be aware of. And sometimes we can go hours you know, engaging uh, with platforms without, before we realize that, you know what, this is just really not making me feel good. So these are just a few simple steps that we can think about in our lives. But the, the bottom line is they can't be on individuals alone to change all of this. There's a responsibility uh, that the platforms have uh, to design, because they, look, I'll tell you this, as a doctor, what I care about most is not how much time you're spending on, on social media. I mean, that's not my goal to maximize that. Well, my goal is to say, well, how can we make sure that's time well spent? Time that actually supports your relationships, that makes you feel better, that helps you be healthier mentally and physically. Like, how do we do that, right? And Because that, to me, is, is a good use of technology. Um, but I don't think we're there in terms of how these platforms are ultimately designed, which is why I think policymakers have a really important role to step in. It's been more than a decade that we've had tech, a lot of these social media platforms around. Uh, I personally don't see the rate of progress we need on ensuring that there is safety and a focus on protecting the mental health of young people in particular uh, that we need. And that's why I think policymakers have a role here. But Jim can, can speak to that as well. I know yeah, yeah. And, and Jim, we, we actually really, we were gonna get to this at a later time. It's a perfect segue into the power of holding tech companies accountable and what that framework would look like and what, what we should be, what questions should we a be asking these tech companies to make sure that the, the roots of these issues are what's being targeted? Well, that, that's a great question, Trey. And I would say this, first of all, uh, Dr. Murthy's correct that you can't just look at social media companies and big internet companies as good or bad, right? They do certain things well and, and that are really positive for our society and they do certain things really badly. And I'm gonna focus a little on the, second, the latter part of that. So I actually believe they're fundamentally responsible for a, part, a significant part of the mental health crisis that we're all facing today. And I do not believe they've been held accountable. And I, I say that as the person running the largest advocacy group in the United States, if not globally, on these issues. So I actually believe they need to be held accountable. Number one, by their users, but even by government. And basically, you should know, we're here in California, that most of the important laws regulating the tech industry have been passed either in Sacramento, mostly written and sponsored by Common Sense Media, or in Europe. Washington, in general, has completely failed you. Completely failed you. They have talked about this, they have made some, they have put forward certain pieces of legislation, and they haven't passed anything since Mark Zuckerberg was in diapers. And so that was a long time ago, guys. And so this is really true. So I actually believe that, like any other, I actually look at it in the way, when you listen to what Dr. Murthy said, uh, comparing this to an epidemic, he compared it to obesity, to smoking, to other huge impacts on our physical and mental health. Now, in sm there is liability for cigarette companies. There, uh, there, we have liability for uh, products that can be harmful. So I actually believe, and we have a bill, it's SB 278 if you wanna know the number, that Senator Nancy Skinner from the Northern California is uh, hosting right now that would hold the big social media companies. That means TikTok, YouTube, Insta, you guys all know which platforms you're on, liable for the damage to the physical and mental health of their users. And if you look at the research, because we've done a lot of research among young people about this, both young, young women and young men, they talk about a lot of the features like location sharing, like universal access. There are many aspects of the social media, plan, and like some of the algorithmic content that is drilled into them, pushing anorexic themes or suicidal themes, or you, look at how many people are nodding. They, you guys know, the young people here know. So they should be held responsible for that. There is a bill right now in California that will be heard, it will be decided upon really in the next few weeks that you all should be aware of, SB 278. Uh, it's 287, thank you, 287, Robert, thank you. And it would be the first legislation in the United States, and it will be, it'll basically be the law of the land that would hold the platforms responsible. I will say this, there are a couple of legislators, I doubt I'm gonna call them out personally right now, who are gonna make or break this bill. And they're based in Los Angeles. So if you want to afterwards, I'll, I'll explain to you exactly who they are. Because we tried to pass this bill last year, and it got held up at the last minute. And it shouldn't be. But fundamentally, 
The tech companies need to be held accountable for this, and we shouldn't mince words. They are, as much as the good stuff that they do, part of the problem when it comes to the mental health crisis in this country, period, full stop. And you all should be part of the solution, and I'm happy to go into that more. Yeah, I think there's that was perfectly on point with what we, yeah, I think that there's it's just such a big issue and, and it's the root of the whole thing. So thank you so much for sharing that. And yeah, if, if solutions, I think from a solution standpoint as well, both of you have so much information on, on the ways that we can provide that. Um, I was, uh, I wanted to kind of go back for a second though to this idea of community that you were talking about, Dr. Murthy. Um, and it's true. I mean, going to the gym is, is, is a battle you can't do alone. You need to have that support system with you, and you've talked a lot about that. And when we, when I, when me and Meredith were seniors, Dean Bay mentioned this, and we're about to graduate. Scary. Um, we thought a lot about your op-ed and what you talked about with loneliness. Um, and we have all these built-in communities within our school, right, and the systems that are supporting us, even on our phone and stuff. Just like we have communities around us that we, we can create, but once we graduate, all that's going to be gone. And that's something we've kind of had to grapple with, with graduation and right around the corner. Um, I'm curious what the research has shown and what you've kind of um, delved into about how we build those communities back up again when we don't have systems and support systems around us that are within our schools. Yeah, and I, I just want to add to that. It's interesting. We have spent at least you know, 15, 18 years of our lives in schools where we have these built-in communities, but within school, we never are taught or we never learn what happens when we graduate and we don't have a built-in community. We're not taught how to create that community or how to deal with loneliness. So, um, I mean, we're asking obviously so the audience can hear, can hear your answer, but we're also asking selfishly for ourselves, like what are your tips for us? Um, Cause we'll be out of here in the next couple of weeks. <laughs> Literally May 12th. Yeah. <laughs> May 12th, wow, that is coming up. Yeah. Look, it's a really important question you're asking, and not just for graduates, but for anyone making a major transition in their life, right? Moving to another city to take a new job, um, retiring, you know, for those of you who may be considering that or know people who are, all of these transitions are times when our social networks can get disrupted. And we do need ways to reconstitute them, to, to build a connection back into our lives. So a, a few things that I, I would recommend. One is to remember that if you want, if you have good friends now whose company you enjoy in college, don't let go of them. Find a few that you can actually stay in touch with. And that means being intentional about it. If you just wait for someone to call you, you know, they get busy, you get busy, it just doesn't happen. But I was talking to a, a friend the other day who said that during the pandemic, when everyone's lives were being turned upside down in the early days, he made a decision that he was gonna call one person a day from his contact list, right? And he reconnected with so many people in that first year of the pandemic because he was intentional about it. Like it didn't actually take a whole lot of time for him, but he was intentional. So that's one thing I would do, is make sure that you're proactively building time into your day to reach out to other people. Now, I think that can be as simple as 15 minutes a day on your way to work, on your way back home, uh, you know, when you're taking a walk in your neighborhood, when you're having a meal, you can just call, uh, you know, somebody and talk to them, old friend, a family member, whoever. The second thing that you can do is to think about groups that you can join in your community. Now, in the last 50 years, 50, 60 years in America, there's been a decline in participation in faith organizations, recreational leagues, civic organizations, and other groups that bring people together. But those are actually still very powerful, right? Now, it could be uh, a sports league that you join. It could be a soccer league. It could be uh, an interest group of another sort. It could be a pottery class that you join. Whatever it is, I know sometimes we can think, oh, it feels a little hokey for me to go and just join a group with a whole bunch of people that I don't know. But you know what? That's actually how we've been living for much of the last hundreds of years. Uh, and we actually have, it's only been in recent history that we have withdrawn from so many of the groups in society. This is our time to, to reconnect. So, you know, you have to push yourself a little bit, but try joining one group, one group in your community. And the last thing I would suggest to you is that many of you, when you leave school, may be joining another job, or maybe you're, you, you are going to graduate school, but you're going to a community where there are other people. You don't know them yet. You don't have relationships with them. But those relationships won't get built if you're just occupying the same space together. There has something intentional has to happen. 
Uh, and what I would encourage you to do is to just take the initiative to just to start by saying hi to people that you don't know, by asking people if they want to get lunch or get coffee together. When I was a first year medical student, uh, I didn't really know anybody in, in my class. And I was moved to a new city to go to medical school. And I was a shy introvert to begin with. None of the, all of these was stacking against me in terms of like increasing my risk for being uh, lonely and isolated. But I did one thing that made me a little uncomfortable initially, but turned out to be probably the single best thing I did in medical school, which is I used my lunch and dinner times to just have one-on-one -on -one conversations with one of my classmates, right? So I would, on a given period of lunch, I would ask you know, somebody, hey, do you wanna have lunch tomorrow? Do you wanna have dinner next Thursday? And those are some of the richest conversations I had. Some of the people I'm close friends with today were people I had one-on-one -on -one conversations with in those first few months of, of school. So the bottom line is these simple practices can go a long way toward helping us rebuild a community. And I actually do think that these are the kind of skills that we, we need to teach our graduates about and teach everyone about because we all go through transitions uh, in life and they are some of our most difficult times. But having the skills to build a community, that can be a lifeline during those transitions. Hey, Shreya and um, Meredith, let me ask you a question for a second. So you asked me about digital media and social media. You, you're seniors. How much do you think it affects you and your peers in terms of your mental health? I'd like to know what you all think. I know we're going to hear from the audience. But how much, the two of you, how, how much do you think it's a factor in your own mental health for better and for worse? Yeah, definitely. I think, I think there are a couple different angles to this. There is social media, and then there's digital media and journalism. And I guess I'll start with the journalism okay. angle. As, okay. as a journalism major, um, I work in our lovely newsroom here. I think in terms of our responsibility as journalists and just as any type of content creator, we have a certain level of responsibility in being in making sure we're not adding to this mental health crisis. So I think at our newsroom here, a lot of that starts with the kind of language that we use. So we've made a, a lot of changes in terms of how we report on things like addiction and suicide and any sort of mental health struggles. So we're very intentional about what kind of stuff we publish and what kind of stuff we don't. And those have been ongoing conversations that have started you know, before the pandemic. So any time that I'm handling a story, whether it's for you know um, National Eating Disorder Awareness Week or May is Mental Health Awareness Week. So whenever we're handling a story like that, we handle it obviously with extra care. We make sure the people who are working on the stories are, are people who feel comfortable working on the stories and who know our, our ethics guide around that. Um, and as for social media, I mean, it impacts me all the time. I was always saying that I, you know, I'm someone who likes to go to bed early and I, you know, growing up, I never really had FOMO, fear of missing out, for those of you, for those of the, the older people in the audience, like my mom, ah, <laughs> might not know what people. that means. <laughs> um, um, but I think the real reason that I personally have FOMO, and maybe this resonates with other students, is I feel totally fine until I open up my phone and see on social media other people hanging out. And that's when those feelings tends, tend to hit me. Otherwise, I feel totally fine, you know, being by my, being, you know, by myself and, and doing things on my own that make me feel good and, and that resonate with me. But it's not until I open up social media that then I'm seeing everything that's going on around me, whether it's people I know or don't know. And then I'm starting to feel this huge disconnect between what I'm doing and between what others are doing. So valid and FOMO is real. Um, I think that from my angle too, um, Dr. Murthy, you mentioned um, this like numbing scrolling feeling. Yeah. I feel like sometimes I get into that zone, and I, I think a lot of people do. I don't know if um, the, the term, I think it's like revenge bedtime procrastination is what, someone sent me an article about it. They were like, you might have this. Um, but uh, this idea that so much of our lives, we have classes from nine to five, whatever it is, and then we get back and we feel like so much of the day is kind of taken away from us because of that. And so I'll sit on my phone, and I'm like, finally, some me time. Let me sit there and just go through and catch up on everything. And I mean, we're both journalism majors, so news is a big thing that we're keeping up on. And, surrounded by it throughout the day that we're just like, okay, let's have a moment to ourselves to just scroll and that turns into hours. And then it's kind of like this hamster, we hamster wheel of day is going to start again in a couple of hours and we lost so much. So I'll say that social media does do that to me sometimes. There's a lot of good that can come from social media. And like um, we talked about the Caleb, uh, the, the Heisman, um, what am I talking about? The C's the awkward 
there are the words for it, but we did a PSA. Yep. And in that PSA, we got to kind of talk about um, reaching out to a friend in time of need and um, do it in a way that was like um, compatible with social and it, and it aired at the football games. And there was just something really good about using social media and using short form video to be able to make a difference and, and use it to bring light to issues as opposed to take away from it, which sometimes when we're on our phone and we see the negative of social media, that can happen. But I think that there's a positive with it too and something we can really lean into on the other side of it. So two, I'm just gonna ask, I'm gonna be the questioner. So two follow-up questions. One, how much is it body image stuff? Cause I am the father of uh, two daughters, one of whom sitting over there. And so, how much of the body image stuff that I think is a huge issue, you know, we were, I was talking about anorexia, you guys were talking about eating disorders, do you think is exacerbated social media platforms? And then second, any chance you can show us the PSA with Caleb Williams? I think we could cue it for sure, but let me, yeah. But uh, yeah. I'm really yeah. interested in the body image stuff and how much you think you're affected and you and your friends and colleagues, and also even when you're in high school. Yeah, I think this is something that I've thought about a lot. I think the huge difference with social media is that instead of seeing, you know, say you see, a couple hundred people a day when you're going to class or sitting in class, going to events, hanging out with friends, and all you have is to compare yourself to those people. I mean, in an ideal world, you're not, but you know, in a realistic world, you might be. Um, so you're comparing yourself to those people that you're seeing in your life on a day-to-day -day basis, and it's gonna be more or less the same, the same people every day, the same people you have classes with. And I think why social media exacerbates it so much is because you're now not just seeing you know, 200 people every day, you're seeing 200,000 people every day scrolling through TikTok, you're seeing people you don't know, people who you're not seeing in real life, you're not seeing their struggles, you're not seeing them as a whole human, you're seeing just what they're showing, their physical self or whatever they're talking about on social media. And now your circle has expanded fivefold or whatever it might be, rather than you know just this small community. And that's already a struggle as it is to not compare yourself to those people around you in, in terms of body image and stuff. But when you bring in these thousands of people online who are showing themselves at their best and from their best angles with their best lightings. You know, now there's certain uh, selfie lights that are trending, like all, all of these things are exacerbating that. So we just have, you know, thousands of more people to compare ourselves to. And, and obviously that's, that's gonna take a toll, a, a toll on us. And I know it has for, you know, myself and many of my friends and, and just conversations that we have. Yeah, and I agree. I think it's just comparisons. It's just access to be able to make your own opinions about what you see online and stuff. And like, you know, having that comparison at your disposal to go down that train of thought of, you know, I'm scrolling for hours and hours and I'm numbing time, but also I'm overthinking a little bit. And, you know, everyone kind of has that facade and no one really knows what someone's experiencing behind the other side. And we've kind of built this culture surrounding it. So um, I would say it's definitely something that exists and something that, I mean, by taking time to to disconnect and put our phones away and have those meaningful conversations, definitely going to adopt that idea of meeting someone at lunch or dinner and, and having really meaningful conversations because something that small can just go such a long way and we don't have to worry about the facades and this world within our phones because we're so in the present and, and things like that. I mean, I'm trying to adopt and I know everyone out there um, does their best to be able to implement it, but it, with all of those distractions on social media, it's gonna be something that takes time, and I'm assuming something we can't cure overnight, but we can make small steps towards. That's awesome, go ahead. And can, can I ask just one more follow-up too, and I promise we'll let you ask questions too. Yeah, <laughs> but, we're good. Um, when you look around you, and by the way, everything you're saying resonates so deeply, because this is what we hear from so many young people across the country, and this is what I, um, you know, I, I mentioned to policymakers and folks around the country all the time, which is that if you really want to understand how social media is affecting young people, ask them. Like they have tremendous insight, and they will tell. And you, you're you're experiencing it, and and I think that your generation has raised a flag many times, you know, about and has ideas about solutions. So I'm so glad that you're sharing. I'm curious when you look at your peers, are there practices that they are putting in place when it comes to? their use of technology uh, that you think are helping them, like ways of either putting guardrails around their use of technology or focusing on elements of social media use that help them and don't hurt them? Like, What have you seen in terms of shifts in behavior that have been helpful? 
Yeah, I think one thing that um, started when I was in high school is my friends and I used to do what we called phone piles. So whenever we were hanging out in a big group, we would literally just pile up all of our iPhones and be like, okay, but that's the phone pile, we don't touch it. Um, as you know, especially when we were just trying to engage in a big group with one another, there's always this few people who are on the sides on their phone and it kind of is just a downer on the whole mood. So that's, that's one thing for sure. And another thing that I've tried to do, and I'll admit my flaws with this, but um, you know, kind of a, a Band-Aid solution, I guess, that, that uh, I guess it's Apple has done is um, you can set a, a time limit on certain, yeah. on certain apps. So I've done that for all of my social media apps. It's pretty easy to click ignore this time limit, and I Guilty. know that <laughs> because I do it about every other day. Guilty, yeah. But I, I'm trying to get out of that rut of clicking the ignore button. It's, it's hard, and again, it's such a Band-Aid solution, but those are two things that come to mind. And I don't know, I think, so number one time limit, I ignore, I'm guilty as well of that. But I think what I've found is really helpful and for my peers as well is having, like it goes back to community, like having activities that take you out of, of being drawn into your phone. Like for instance, like I teach yoga on campus and we have these classes over at Fisher Art Museum and even just for like that hour of time, no phones really. And, and I'm not like, I'm not like leave your phones at the door, like, you know, keep them on the side. Like it's just a natural thing because everyone's so present and they're engaging in something with their community, right? Like it's with people and their friends and people they don't see every day, but they're all there for some like higher purpose, which is to help themselves. So like doing activities like that, or even if I'm by myself going for like a walk outside or you know, doing small things that take me out of my space and out of my phone is really the way to do it, in my opinion. But. You know, I would just say this, Dean Bay, I know, but I was going to remember, when we've done events, Dean Bay said, everybody take their phones. Remember, you did the whole basket trick. Take your phones, put them over here. Uh, that's my rule at Stanford, too. You cannot be on your phone or a lot. You have to take notes with a real, remember, you can write, because I don't want you being distracted. <laughs> but, uh, but I want to, I, I, if you can show the PSA, I think that would be awesome. I'll just say this. We ran a campaign that uh, Dean Bay helped on called Device Free Device Free Dinner, starring a UCLA, a US, a UC, oh my God, UCLA, USC graduate Will Ferrell. Okay. Will Ferrell, and it won the Global Award as the best public service campaign of the year. Okay. So you should show us the Caleb Williams ad if you can, because then I think this could be the forerunner to a really interesting campaign mm -hmm. that we could all work on. So if you've got it. It's up. When the stadium lights are dimmed, when the cameras stop flashing, when the pads are off, the pressure sinks in and it's just me. Just me in a world of expectation. Nobody can carry that alone. But pressure doesn't have to be carried alone. What if we came together as a team? Embrace talking openly about our mental health. If we reached out, checked in. Seize the awkward. Imagine what we could do. So that's the shorter version of about a two minute video, but yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome you did that, Treya. And I'm curious, so I want to, I know we asked some questions about post-grad, but I want to jump back into, for the students in the room, um, what we can do here at college. So Jim, as a professor, and you, Dr. Murthy, with all of your experience, at a school like USC or Stanford where you teach, um, hustle culture is such a big thing. We're always trying to find the next thing to do, whether it's to put on a resume or just keep ourselves busy. So how can students help balance the drive for success and to do great things after we graduate with care for their mental health? Is there a way for do, to do that? And can success and mental well-being truly go hand in hand? So I think I'm gonna let Dr. Murthy answer, but I'd say a couple things. Number one, I think about this as the dad of four kids too. I think you guys are under much greater stress than I was when I was your age. It's a massive difference. I think social media is a big part of it, quite frankly. But I also think it's because of a lot of other pressures that are real now and have become much more real in the last 10 or 15 years. So I think, actually, Dr. Murthy mentioned this earlier. Part of it is having honest dialogue with your friends about it, knowing you're not alone, that everybody's going through it. I watch my students at Stanford and think, and, and I watch my own children, and I think, oh my God, I don't know how you're dealing with all this. But I will tell you, the community that Dr. Murthy's talking about is so, if you're not alone, in fact, almost everybody you know is going through the same stuff. So I think so much of it is talking about that and finding that you're not alone, in fact, that you're all going through the same, and then talking about what are the simple things that help you deal with it. I also think that it's incumbent on, quite honestly, on elite universities like SC and Stanford to deal with this issue. I think we put too much pressure on 
young people. I think the admissions, this one, I think college admissions process now is insane, having gone through it now four times as a dad. And I think we ought to deal with that. I actually really do. And I think that if schools like SC and Stanford, really global leaders, start to think about how to do that and take some of the pressure off of students, that that would really be, that's something that the administration can do and leaders and faculty can do. But I think it's just talking with your friends about it and being honest and vulnerable, just the way that, I mean, I think when Dr. Murthy shows you his own vulnerability as a Surgeon General and as a human being, like even did today, that's, that's, that's half the battle right there. No, well, well said, Jim. And I think you're asking the question we should all be asking about our lives, not just students, which is what is success? Yeah. And my worry is that we have defined success in a way that I think is literally driving people to distress and that it's contributing to the mental health crisis that we have in our country. And the first time I heard that term hustle culture was actually with USC students at a virtual roundtable that we did in the early days of the pandemic. And since then, I've heard it in so many places, right? And so my question is, what are we hustling after? What are we chasing? Right? And we all take our cues as to what we're chasing uh, based on what society tells us success is. Right? So most reliably, you know, we, we think about the signals we get, whether it's on social, whether it's in the books we read, the news stories we hear, the, the profiles that are written, the movies that are made. They're usually holding up people who are famous, who are powerful in some way, maybe they have a fancy job, or who have a lot of money. Right? So fame money, power, right? Those are three ways that we define success. And if you've got all three of them, wow, then you're a mega success. But Jim and I and Dean Bay and many of you in this room know people who are rich and famous and powerful and profoundly unhappy, right? These are not actually the keys to success. In some ways, these are somewhat arbitrary indicators that we've picked and we said, ah, that's gonna be success. But I actually have a sense of what real success is for most people. And it's actually very simple. And the reason I know it is not because I have some deep inherent wisdom, it's because I've spent a lot of time with patients who are at the end of their life, sitting by their bedside and hearing their reflections on what's really mattered to them and the lives that they've lived. And you know what they talk about? Well, I'll tell you what they don't talk about. They don't talk about how much money was in their bank account. They don't talk about how many followers they had on social. Uh, they don't talk about how big their corner office was or how fancy their title was. They don't talk about any of that. What people talk about in the final moments of life, when they're reflecting on what was most deeply meaningful to them, they talk about their relationships. They talk about the people they love, the people who love them, the people they wish they had spent more time with, people who broke their hearts. It's very clear that in those final moments of life that what truly matters is the love that we give and receive from each other. And if we know that at the end of life, there's no reason that we've got to wait that long, right? We can build that into how we live from the earliest stages. And what that means is that we have to start chasing relationships and we have to also chase purpose, right? Purpose and people are two incredible sources of success, of fulfillment. Uh, that we should be teaching young people how to, how to chase. And frankly, for those of us who can perhaps no longer consider ourselves to be in the young category, we have to re-educate ourselves because many of us, regardless of our age, have been steeped in a culture that has been telling us to chase, chase, chase certain things that are not leading to our happiness. Now, we start changing that through conversation. When you sit down with your friends and you really have an honest conversation about what, what do I really want? What has made me happy before? Like, think about the moments where you've been most deeply happy. Not the moment where you got into a fancy school and you felt a moment of joy, or where you, uh, let's say, you know, you were on the sports team, you all guys won a game together, you felt a moment of joy. I mean, those are great moments, but when you think what has given you sustained deep fulfillment, that's what you should be chasing. That's a conversation we need to be having, having as a society, but they start on campuses like this, in small groups of friends who are talking honestly over dinner, you know, or you know, at the end of a day about what really matters to you. And finally, I'll just say this, look, you will find yourself in situations where the world is telling you to be someone that doesn't quite feel right. And in those moments, listen to yourself. Because sometimes we have a, a tendency to think, well, everyone else can't be wrong. 
I'm probably the one who's like, you know, missing something here. But a lot of times, no, you're not the one missing something. When your intuition tells you that something is not speaking to you, doesn't feel meaningful, that's an important source of information. And if there's anything that you chase, like chase inspiration, chase purpose, chase relationships, because those things will give you lasting happiness, lasting fulfillment, and they are the bedrock of a society that's truly healthy from a mental health perspective. Amen. Wow. Talk so about beautifully it. said. As seniors, that felt like the commencement advice we needed. So thank you so much. That was that's so great. And I, I wonder, are we? We're gonna maybe take some questions from the audience. Are you all? Are you ready to give up your role as questioners in chief for a sec? I okay. think the audience has some fun things to um, say. So great. I'm gonna go back here. Do we have a mic? Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks uh, for your time. Uh, I really love to hear both of you talk. And it seems like a really great uh, initiative. Stand up. Uh, it seems like a really great initiative. I I'm curious the extent that you've thought about how these initiatives interact with the rise in social anxiety. And that, like, as someone who's interested in this topic, this sounds great. I'd love to participate and, you know, try some of these things in my own life. But there's tons and tons of young people who aren't interested in that and that you know are using social media phones as crutches and the notion of you know talking to someone on the phone or having dinner without your phone those are stressful things for them and so how do you think about reaching segments of the youth that aren't necessarily right here with you on this as a big issue for them well it's a really good question and tell me your name sir uh, owen. owen okay well thanks owen for that question i mean you're absolutely right that People are at different stages, right, in terms of their own mental health and well-being, how, how much insight they have into their relationship with tech and how it's impacting them and how willing and ready they are to take action. But here's what I do know. I know that the most important messengers to reach people aren't always people like me in government. The most important messengers are the people around you. right? So when, yes, you may have a friend who's struggling with social anxiety, uh, let's say, but if that's a friend of yours, and if you tell them, hey, I, I want you to join me in something. Uh, I want you to try, let's, why don't we try something out together? Um, I feel a little scary at first, but we'll have each other's backs. That makes it much more likely that somebody is willing to take a step forward in terms of creating space for themselves, you know, to, without social media or taking opportunities to build relationships than if somebody on a stage, you know, tells them to do so. And that's where it comes back to this idea of us actually looking out for one another and checking on one another. Um, we cannot survive on our own. We can't make it through life solely on the basis of our own hard work and our own intelligence. We all, regardless of our talent level, need one another. And this is a time where I think we have to reconstitute an ethic of connection and obligation to one another. Like that old saying you know, from scripture about being your brother's keeper, there's deep wisdom in that that we see reflected in many faith traditions. Right? But it's this, based on a fundamental understanding that to truly, th truly thrive, we need each other's support and engagement because we're all going to fall off uh, the wagon at some point. We're all going to go down a path of action and activity and behavior that's actually harmful to us. And we need people at that time who can pull us back uh, with kindness, you know, with the power of their example and who can stay with us. So this is a time where I would encourage you to think about the people in your life who may be struggling and to think about how you can be of service to them, even by opening up a conversation about their mental health, about perhaps bringing them with you when you try something different, whether that's going to an event or taking a break or having discrete places in your life where you don't have tech. Uh, and they will do that for you as well. And you'll find finally when you do that, you will help yourself. Because we have realized over time that service to others, whether that's helping a friend or whether that's volunteering in your community, this is one of the most powerful antidotes to loneliness and isolation that we have. Perfectly said. The only thing I would add is for the adult, for the older people in the audience is, and this isn't easy, and trust me, my daughter would tell you I don't always do it, is you got to model the behavior yourself sometimes. I actually think modeling the behavior and then saying and what, and what Vivek just said. But I actually think you can do that, and you can do that with your peers, and I think parents can do that with kids, and I think educators can do that, and not being judgmental, listening, not being judgmental, just listening and experiencing it with people. That's a great question. Yeah. Let's see, I'm going to go, I'm going to do you, I know you've had your hand, I'm going to go to maybe one of you two ladies. You have to flip for it. Hi. Um, What's your name? I'm, my name is Amina, I'm a senior here. 
Uh, one thing that separates platforms like TikTok from older social media platforms, in my opinion, is that um, they rely on short form user generated content these days, um, which gives them much quicker trend cycles, right? Um, so what are the primary ways um, you think that these quick and user generated trend cycles exacerbate the spread of um, like body trends to girls and women um, on social media compared to older platforms? Well, I'd say if, uh, that's a really great question. Um, I'd say a few things. One, um, and by the way, I, I, the, the big, it's interesting if you all watch the controversy over TikTok right now, which is really the most popular platform. To me, I'm not worried about the China factor. I'm worried about the impact on young people. And I will tell you, Common Sense works with TikTok behind the scenes. We don't do this that publicly, particularly on the, on the fact that we know that there are seven, eight, and nine-year-olds on TikTok, not just juniors at SC. There's a lot of seven, eight, and nine-year-olds who are getting exposed to unbelievable content. Number one, they, they should be held, one of, the, one of the bill that I said, 287, right, Rami? 287 requires them to describe the algorithms to show what is in the algorithms, which is what feeds you. You know, you're on TikTok, you don't know exactly what you're gonna get. They have an algorithm that's sending you something they think is gonna get you to stay there and become more addicted to their platform. So part of it is you're gonna have, we're gonna have to hold those uh, platforms responsible and liable for, for what, what I said earlier, but also you have to expose the algorithms. But I think it's also, you've gotta to go to the people who run the companies at the highest level and have a really honest discussion with them about what they're doing. And, and, and ask them as parents, and as community members, as Dr. Murthy was just saying, what is their responsibility? Because in general, people want to do the right thing, but they have not been asked that question enough. So I think, I think you've got to go to the top of the big platforms now and on an ongoing basis, hold them responsible, but asking them to be part of the solution. Hi, thank you. My name is Lillian. I'm a graduating senior. Um, Congratulations. Thank you. While mainstream discussions of mental health are important in building communities, many minority groups have a different perspective on what mental health means. How is the U.S. on a national scale reaching these communities and addressing mental health in an inclusive way and destigmatizing it? Well, thank you so much for that question. And you're spot on that there's a culture around mental health that's different from community to community, sometimes based on age, but sometimes based on race and ethnicity, like the, the group that I come from, when I think I, my parents are originally grew from India and you know, they you know, grew up in a, you know, in a home that had a very strong Indian culture. And there was certainly a way of thinking about uh, mental health that was really shrouded in secrecy and you know, people didn't really talk about it and they worried that if you had a mental health problem in your house and nobody would wanna get married into your family, I mean, sound familiar? Like these are, these are some challenges that like a lot of uh, families had to deal with when I was growing up. Um, and what is really important, I think, for us to ensure that we are lifting up all communities when it comes to addressing health, which means making it easier for all communities to talk about mental health, uh, is number one, that we are recruiting, engaging leaders within those communities to start and guide conversations on mental health. Second, that we are building a mental health workforce of psychiatrists, psychologists, school counselors, and others who represent the diversity of the community members that they're seeking to serve. And that's gotta be, that's critical because you know, we can wish away our differences or we can accept the reality that we all have different sort of beliefs and structures that are shaped by the communities we grew up in. And it's only by making sure that there's conversations happening from within that community, uh, I think that we can truly address that stigma. And that's what we talk about. When we, uh, you know, from my office, when we, we interact and engage with communities, we're often trying to bring in members of diverse communities uh, so that people can see, hey, on stage, there's somebody who shares my background who's talking about these issues. Maybe it's not so taboo in my community after all. And I would just tell you, you know, California has a Surgeon General. Dr. Murthy knows that. And the first ever California Surgeon General, Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, basically this is what she focused on. Because her whole thing is about that people from black and brown communities and from low and from low income communities and with different experiences have huge mental health and other challenges and we need to focus on them. And I, your question is great and we will never deal with the complexity of the mental health crisis unless we understand the diversity of that and actually what Vivek said is exactly right and have representatives of those communities leading the way to the solutions. It's a great question. 
Hi, my name's uh, Scott, and uh, I'm a part of a nonprofit here in LA. And for 15 years, the conversation has been around physical health and mental health is slowly becoming a more of a conversation. But it seems like we need another pillar, which is social health, and how um, those two have been, it seems like social health has kind of been tucked underneath mental health versus us having social health as its own pillar as well that interlinks and connects to physical health and mental health. So what do you think about raising up social health so it has a greater sense so where we could talk about isolation and loneliness and these sorts of things um, and allow it to be its own thing versus kind of tucked away under mental health you know, or even physical health? So I think uh, that is such a great point, and I, I agree with you. I think it is related to mental health because it influences mental health outcomes, but it influences a lot of other outcomes too. And interestingly, it's not even just physical health outcomes that we talked about earlier, but we know that when communities are actually connected to one another, they tend to be more economically prosperous, they tend to have lower rates of violence, they tend to be more resilient in the face of adversity like hurricanes and tornadoes. So whether you're thinking about optimizing Again, economics, disaster preparedness, education, because we know that social connection impacts how kids do in school, how adults perform and produce in the workplace. From all these perspectives, social connection actually is like the fuel uh, that allows us to, to feed all of these channels in our life. So I do think you're right. It makes sense to think of it, uh, it meaning social health, as its own category. And I think for many people, Using mental health as the door uh, through which they can start to talk about that and understand that might, might be a starting point, but I think we do need to establish as its own thing. And that's one of the reasons why in this advisory, we lay out all of these other consequences of loneliness and isolation separate from mental health uh, that in involve really the underpinnings of our individual lives and of society. All right, thank you so much for those questions. That's the last one we're gonna take. And before we wrap up, I just wanna take a minute to thank both Dr. Murthy and Jim Steyer for coming in and being with us here today. Thank you so much. I cannot think of a better kind of send off before uh, Shreya and I graduate. So thank you all for your wisdom and your tips and for the important work that you're doing. Um, it's, it's so great of you to come uh, spend some of your time with us here today. So one more thank you for you all. And, and could we get a could we get a round of applause for Meredith and Shreya for being incredible? They're great. Moderators? Woo! Woohoo! Um, so as I understand it, this concludes our program, but Dr. Murthy has generously um, offered to spend a few minutes if folks want to come up and take a picture with you. And I know your staff is here to help facilitate that. So thank you very much. And thanks for being so generous with your time and your wisdom today. Jim, big kiss to you. Thank you guys. Thank you all so much for coming.